coming from my home in Tacoma, Washington, which is the home of the Puyallup tribe who have lived here since time immemorial. The land that I live on was taken from the Puyallup people and promises made to the tribe by the United States government and the Medicine Creek Treaty were broken. Many of us here tonight are also calling from stolen land. And if you don't know whose land you're on, you can find it in the link that we are posting in the chat. So uh, we have folks calling from all over the Northwest tonight for the call. And in the chat, if you can take a moment to let us know where you're calling from and whose land that you're on, uh, that way we can all get to know sort of where we are all coming from. Uh, I also encourage all of you once you learn whose land you're on to learn more about the tribal nation that used to or still does live in your area and find out ways that you can support them as allies. Tonight though, we are all coming together for the Lower Snake River, which has sustained dozens of tribes, including the Nez Perce or the Nimipu, since time immemorial. And to help us center on this place, I'm pleased to introduce Elliot Moffat, who is a board member of Nimipu Protecting the Environment and former Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee member. So with that, Elliot, I will turn things over to you. All right, good enough. Thank you, Rob. And I, I also see that uh, I'm uh, that Lucy uh, Simpson from our board is is on too, so um, she can chime in at any time she wants to. And and um, um, I just came through um, uh, something of a snowstorm. I came over our prairie. Um, I live on the Nez Perce Indian Reservation, and and um, uh, it's a diverse environment. I went from about 800 feet to about 3,000 feet in the last hour and was plowing through some snow drifts to get here. So it, I'm still uh, de-stressing at this point. But um, uh, it's, it's good to be here with everyone. And um, it is, um, let me explain, I'm the president of Nimipu Protecting the Environment. And i um, uh, my name is Elliot Moffat, and uh, my Nez Perce name is Ed Palatkit, and um, uh, that name was was given to me. And um, also, um, Nimipu means um, uh, the people. It's translated, and this is what we called ourselves back in the day. And then, um, in historical times, then we got the name Nez Perce. So. Um, that's why we call ourselves Nimipu, protecting the environment. And we got started um, around 2013 when we were uh, activists in the uh, Megalodes um, rolling blockade. There was um, uh, tar sands equipment, gargantuan equipment being uh, traversing this reservation. And um, everyone was a afraid that something would happen to these gargantuan uh, equipment that they'd end up in our salmon streams, in our streams along along the reservation here. And uh, so uh, no one was looking at the impacts of, of these gargantuan equipment if they were to tip over into the river. No one was looking at that and, and the Forest Service uh, the, the Highway 12 that they were traversing would go through the National Forest Service land. And um, they're our trustee. We have treaties with the United States in which the United States promised to do certain things. And um, in exchange for that, then we, what the Nez Perce did was to cede land to uh, the United States in exchange for things like being able to continue our tradition and culture of fishing. And uh, so that that is part of our mission is to advocate for our treaty rights and responsibilities. And so um, in that, um, we knew that this equipment would um, uh, block rivers or if they, if they had uh, petroleum in them, they might, you know, hydraulics, they might spill into our rivers. And so, um, the tribe eventually joined um, uh, another organization in suing the um, federal government for um, 
not consulting with the tribe and not looking out after the environment. And uh, we won, the tribe and, and everyone won on that that occasion and they had to stop transporting the, that um, mega equipment. And other folks in Idaho did the same things like in um, Moscow and, and up on, uh, because his equipment would go a different route. So that, so that uh, took place in other areas of Idaho also. Um, and that got us started with uh, Nimi Poo protecting the environment because we saw a lot of our people uh, wanting to get involved and wanting to have a voice about what happens uh, in our territory. And so that led us to, um, to organize. And um, we organized along um, also um, recovery of salmon and freeing the Snake River. And so that's been our emphasis uh, the last few years is to advocate for the uh, breaching of the four lower Snake River dams. And uh, this is the news that, that has come up since we've had our discussions that uh, uh, Representative Sim Simpson from the state of Idaho, Idaho has proposed that we do just that, um, that we breach the four lower Snake dams. And this is um, news of for not only the Pacific Northwest, but also for the United States that, that if we were to do that, that um, there would, it is our claim that there would be then fish for everyone. So um, I don't know if, and um, I'm not sure of our format, if we want, if we were waiting till the end to answer questions, but um, um, we've been uh, working on that issue and, and um, that we did that was to conduct uh, flotillas every year, except this past year due to COVID. And, um, but those were always successful. We had good participation from a lot of folks and we got orca folks involved in, in um, um, our flotilla. And that brought awareness to uh, central Idaho about the plight of, of, of the orcas on, uh, uh, on the other end of the Columbia River, and uh, that that they um, part of their diet consists of salmon, and uh, and a large part of that consists of salmon, and and uh, the orcas um, like are are an apex predator, and we have a similar situation here in Idaho. We're trying to look at uh, grizzly bear. Uh, recovery, but um, they're limited too by as an apex predator to the amount of salmon that get back into their into that country. So um, these are all related, and and so uh, with the with the new administration, then we're waiting to hear on the confirmation of of Deb Holland uh, from Laguna Pueblo to to be the Secretary of Interior, and. Um, the department, the Department of Interior, has authority and supervision over the Fish and Wildlife Service, who has um, responsibilities under the Endangered Species Act. So we're we're waiting to hear on that confirmation, and and um, been supporting um, uh, Representative Holland's confirmation and nomination. Thank you, Elliot. That is. I really appreciate the, the hard work that you and Nimipu have been doing for years. And the rendezvous are, are one of the favorite things of mine to do every year. And it was really sad to not be able to do it this yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have questions for the end. So uh, thank you, Elliot, for grounding us. Okay. And, uh, thank you for Nimipu for being one of our co-hosts tonight. And I also want to thank our other co-hosts for tonight's uh, event, the Center for Biological Diversity, the Endangered Species Coalition, Sierra Club, the, and the Washington Environmental Council. Uh, and before I get started, just some quick Zoom etiquette reminders in case uh, some of you are new to Zoom, which I'm not sure who that is nowadays, uh, but please make sure that you're muted to avoid background noises. We will be asking folks to engage a lot in the chat box. I'm happy to see a lot of that already happening tonight. Um, if you do have questions though, please use the Q&A box, uh, which is right next to the chat box. Uh, otherwise your question will be missed in all the chatting that's happening. 
So thank you once again for joining us for Rally Round the River to rise up for the Snake River salmon, orcas in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, many of you have been involved in this campaign for decades and others may be brand new to it, but regardless of how long you've been involved, now is the time for us to come together and finally restore the Lower Snake River. As Elliot mentioned uh, earlier this month, Congressman Mike Simpson, who's a Republican from Idaho, put forward a very bold proposal to breach the four Lower Snake River dams. This is the first time that a Republican congressperson has ever proposed breaching the Lower Snake River dams, and it would invest millions of dollars to restoring habitat and improving water quality for salmon throughout the Pacific Northwest, from the Columbia Basin, all along the coast, and throughout the Salish Sea, which includes the Puget Sound. Restoring the Lower Snake River alone would make this the biggest salmon restoration project in history. And while there's a lot to be excited about in the Congressman's proposal, there are some areas where we have concerns. For instance, uh, the proposal wanted to start removing the Lower Snake River dams for 10 years. And we think that we can move a lot faster given the extinction crisis that Southern resident orcas and salmon face. So we need to come together to call on our Congress members to tell them that this initial proposal from Congressman Simpson is a great starting point but that we need to act quickly and make sure that we improve this proposal to benefit salmon, orcas, and so many others. Now, there are a lot of great reasons to restore the Lower Snake River, and you'll hear about it from more of our speakers tonight. But before we get there, we wanna know what brought all of you out here tonight. So why do you all want a free Lower Snake River? So to do that, we are going to go to menti.com and enter a code uh, so that you can fill in your answer and it'll generate a big word cloud for us at the uh, end of the event. So the instructions there are up on the screen, menti.com and the code is 19252429. And again, answer the question, why do you want a free flowing snake river? And at the end of the rally, we'll take those answers, turn it into a big word cloud that we can later share on social media. So while you are doing that, let's hear from some folks in the crowd who have already made some amazing rally signs for uh, the rally tonight. Um, so first, we are going to kick it over to Idaho and uh, talk to Connor. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Connor. I'm from Boise, Idaho on traditional Shoshone Bannock lands. Um, I'm here at this presentation to support the salmon in Idaho. Um, I grew up fly fishing and being a guide on the middle fork of the salmon, which as you probably may know is one of the more pristine places and one of the places why uh, we think that salmon can return in successful numbers if we take out these dams. So um, I'm just here to support them and um, you know, wish that sockeye salmon could return to Redfish Lake like they used to and get the namesake back. So. Please act fast and support Simpson and help him get him get it through. Awesome. Thank you, Connor. And from Idaho, we are now going to head over to Washington to Logan. Logan, are you with us? All right, we'll come back to you first, uh, and we'll go instead down to Oregon to Quinn. Hi. Hi. Hi there, I'm Quinn, and this is Malcolm. Can you show the sign that we made? We made a special site without the back of it. <laughs> We're here because we love orcas. We're coming to you from Portland. And um, I was lucky enough as a kiddo to get to see orcas when I was camping in the San Juans. And I really want Malcolm to be able to have that experience. And I know we can't take it for granted. So we're here hoping the dam's open up. It's yours. Can you show the sign? Can you say yay, orcas? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Malcolm, and thank you, Quinn. All right, uh, Logan, are you with us now?
Okay, Logan may be having some technical problems, but that's what life is like here in uh, the 21st century. Um, so again, thank you so much to all of our folks for bringing those signs. I absolutely love the signs at rallies. I love the energy that folks like Malcolm bring to this. Uh, and it's really great to see uh, so many different signs when we're out there at rallies that we thought that it would be great for folks at home to make your own sign. And we're gonna be doing at the end of the call a big photo. We're gonna turn on everybody's cameras. So if you do want to make a sign, uh, get started on that right now, get some arts and crafts, and later we'll take a nice big photo of all these beautiful signs to show folks uh, how many people truly care about this issue. So a lot of people here tonight want to restore the Lower Snake River to help endangered Southern resident orcas, like Malcolm just said. Uh, but few people know about the orcas better than Dr. Deborah Giles, who wears many hats on behalf of these whales. She is the science and research director for the nonprofit Wild Orca and a research scientist for the Center for Conservation Biology at the University of Washington. Monitoring Southern resident killer whales health through non-invasive sampling with the help of her trusty dog, Eva, who is a very highly trained poop detection dog. Through this research, Dr. Giles and Eva, and Eva can inform policymakers of the key actions we need to take to save these orcas, like removing the four lower Snake River dams. So with that, Giles, I will let you uh, take it away. Thank you so much. And do we have a slideshow? Fantastic, thanks, Ash. So thank you, Rob, and everybody else that um, has, uh, are putting this together and, and inviting us to speak. I'm just going to put Eva down. She's heavier than she looks. Um, I'm up here on San Juan Island, the uh, traditional territory of the Coast Salish, Lummi, Samish, Tulalip, Wasnat, and the Songhe, and also the Southern resident killer whales, who have all been here since time immemorial. Uh, I'm with the Center for Conservation Biology with the University of Washington. So thanks, shout out to them for um, keeping this work on the water going. Um, next slide. Sorry, I've been trying to advance myself. I forgot I'm not controlling. Uh, the Southern resident killer whales need Snake River Chinook salmon. I can't really say it any more clearly than that. Uh, these are animals that co-evolved with Pacific salmon uh, up and down the United States, uh, BC, Canada, and even into Southeast Alaska. Next slide. These uh, Southern resident killer whales, uh, just in case there's you know one or two of you, 285 people that are on this call, amazing. Uh, just in case one or two of you don't know, the Southern resident killer whales are uh, fish eaters. They only eat fish. And out of all the different uh, fish species, uh, they really, really want to be eating salmon and out of the salmon that come into contact, they would come into contact with, they really mostly want Chinook salmon. Uh, those are the biggest, fattiest, richest salmon. And historically, you can see from that picture down in the bottom corner, fish used to be massive. And this is why you can have a massive apex predator that is reliant on salmon. Um, unfortunately, the salmon are shrinking for a number of reasons. Uh, not the least of which is all the damming that we've done throughout the Pacific Northwest and the territories uh, of, uh, you know, traditional territories of Pacific salmon. So because the, uh, there's just so many fewer fish from overfishing, bycatch issues, damming issues, just a whole host of reasons. Uh, but the upshot of it is, the bottom line is, is that the whales are not getting enough to eat. Go ahead. The whales, this very small population of whales, we are uh, now count them at just 75 individuals. They were listed on, listed on the endangered species list in the US in 2005. And uh, out of a whole host, a whole list of, of problems, uh, threats facing them, the three that percolated to the surface, uh, to the top of the list were lack of salmon, specifically Chinook salmon. So that's quality and quantity the presence of vessels and associated noise, and the exposure to toxicants in the food web. And out of all of these, the biggest problem is the fact that they don't have enough to eat. When they don't get enough to eat, all of the other threats facing them uh, act in a negative synergistic fashion to really uh, harm these whales uh, on an individual and a population level. Go ahead. 
So we, uh, with the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology, we go out and non-invasively collect fecal samples using our scat detection dog. You can see the picture up there in the top corner uh, with Eba, uh, Eba the whale dog. You can follow her on Instagram and Facebook if you're interested to know what she's up to. Uh, when we uh, are able to collect one of these samples, we can uh, scoop it out of the water and send it back to Dr. Wasser's lab. He's the lead of our program at the Center for Conservation Biology and his lab uh, grad student Will Sano and other folks in his lab analyze each sample for a whole host of different um, uh, variables. And this is just a, a, a list, uh, a, not a complete list of the things that one scat sample can tell us. And through the uh, now over a decade that we've been researching the scat samples from the Southern residents, the main things that are very clear is that um, the lack of salmon, Chinook salmon, leads to high, high pregnancy failure rates, uh, amplification of toxicant effects through the food web. So everything from small phytoplankton and zooplankton being um, uh, uptaking different toxicants that makes its way right up the food web and into the blubber of the southern resident killer whales. Uh, lack of salmon also uh, causes them to, um, sorry, <laughs> increase stress hormones as we do when we don't get enough to eat and ultimately leads to death and, or, uh, death and disease. Go ahead. Thanks, Ash. Uh, last, I'll leave you with this slide. This is just one of my favorite pictures uh, that I've ever seen of a Southern resident. This is two brothers. Uh, the name of this picture taken by the photographer, Jim Maya, calls this the embrace. And um, it really depicts the, the tight bonds that these individuals have with one another. They stay together their entire life. And unfortunately, they're just not getting enough to eat. The opportunity that Mike Simpson's proposal uh, provides for us is a really amazing starting point, point for us to be pushing the dialogue. We're farther along in this dialogue with this announcement from Representative Simpson than we have ever been in the conversations that have been occurring since those dams went in. And if those dams, the dams on the Snake, Lower Snake River were breached, we would be removing dams from tribal lands that were, they didn't uh, the United States did not give uh, get permission from the tribes to put those dams there. And we would be revitalizing a damaged and dying ecosystem. And through that, it would give the native salmon and steelhead the best chances for recovery, which ultimately would lead to more salmon for humans to harvest, but also more salmon for the southern resident killer whales to come into contact with. And so I urgently uh, um, suggest that you um, get engaged. You're doing that tonight by becoming educated. Um, go to all of our different websites. There are so many different nonprofit organizations working on this issue. You can go to Wild Orca. We can uh, teach you how to write a letter or make a call. Um, whatever it takes, however you do it, getting involved in your own community, no matter where you are. I've been seeing people from all over the world on this call. Get involved because we're all connected. We're all in one ecosystem. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I went a little bit long, but thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Southern residents. Awesome. Thank you, Giles, so much. And thank you, Eva, for all the hard work that you both do to help inform the policy that is needed to help these Southern residents. And fortunately, as uh, Elliot mentioned at the top, the new Biden administration is an opportunity for us to move science forward. They pledged to follow the science and making policy, whether that be for recovering wildlife or combating climate change. We all know that we need clean and renewable sources of energy to replace power that will be taken offline when we breach the Lower Snake River dams. A lot of people often ask can and how we do that. But fortunately for us, people like Fred Hewitt from the Northwest Energy Coalition have been exploring that question for a while. Fred is a co-founder of the coalition and is currently the senior policy advisor representing over 100 environmental, civic, and human service organizations, progressive utilities, and businesses in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the Northwest Energy Coalition is working to create 21st century energy system that provides clean, reliable, and affordable energy that sustains our communities and preserves our region's natural resources. And they have been long supporters of restoring the Lower Snake River. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Fred. Hi there, it's uh, Fred Hewitt. I hope you can hear me all. I'm not able to turn on, well now I can turn on my video just so you can see me here in Portland, Oregon. 
uh, long, long time uh, home for many tribal groups. Uh, I won't enumerate them all, but uh, the Portland region and out east into the Columbia Gorge uh, is, uh, has been uh, the home for thousands of years for both the salmon and the tribes. And we thank them both. Um, the Northwest Energy Coalition is the group I work with. Uh, been uh, with it since our start uh, as a volunteer and on the board in the 1980s. We started about 40 years ago, uh, the passage of the Northwest Power Act, which has dual purposes to uh, uh, manage, to help manage the energy uh, electric power system of the Northwest and to uh, preserve, protect, and enhance the fish and wildlife species in the Columbian Snake River basins, especially from the impact of hydropower. So for a couple minutes here, I want to talk about the dams, uh, put them in our uh, the context that we see them in, and uh, perhaps raise some questions uh, that we can take from that point. So here's a picture of one of the four dams. Uh, you can see their uh, concrete and uh, earthen structures. Um, they've been there for, uh, as I'll explain, for quite a while now. Uh, they back up a lot of water behind them, and they change the shape and the nature of the river, as well as generating a lot of clean uh, hydropower. So if you can go to the next slide. There are four lower snake dams. I'm sure many people are aware of this, but just to put it in the, the geographic context, there they are in the center of our region in eastern Washington, but the lower snake drainage actually covers large parts of three states, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Um, there is also one storage dam to Warshak, which you can also see on the map. Um, the, as I'll point out uh, shortly, that's actually an important, important point. There's a lot more storage on the Columbia River than there is on the Snake. So the dams are actually owned and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The power is marketed by the Bonneville Power Administration. They came, uh, the dams came online, the hydropower came online uh, in about a 15 year period. Um, and there are six uh, generating turbines in each dam. You can see a picture down below of one of the turbine halls. Um, three uh, came online first for each of the dams and then three more later on. If you add it all up, 3,100 megawatts of total capacity, they almost never produce that much at the same moment anyway. Um, and the average output is about one third of that, which is pretty typical for hydro dams, about 975 megawatts. That's roughly speaking what the city of Seattle, not the suburb, suburbs, uses or the output of the Columbia Generating Station nuclear plant, just to get a general sense of how much it is. And if you can go to the next slide. So one of the things to understand about the Lower Snake River dams, lots of claims are made about how essential they are to our grid and, you know, will the lights might go out if we don't have them and so forth, and about the cost. So I'll get to the cost and uh, the potential for replacing the dams in a moment. But the first thing I want to point out is there, yes, they produce a fair, uh, fairly large amount of energy for our region, but in context, not actually all that much. The slide here uh, illustrates some of the underlying issues. First of all, unlike the Columbia River side, where they have a lot of hydro storage, both in the U.S. and Canada, there's very little storage on the, on the Snake River. So that means there's really no flood risk management or flood control. They're not all that flexible in how they operate. What the water is in the river is what you have to operate the hydro. Um, and they have limited output when we most need it, especially in the midwinter up to about this time of year and then in the midsummer. So if you look at the chart here, the orange bars are the entire output of the BPA. Uh, it's not that they own it. They manage the hydro output and sell it into the market into their customers. That orange bar is all the hydro in the federal hydro system. And then the blue bar is not separate, it's the part of the overall. But you can see the relationship here. During the spring, the Lower Snake River dams produce quite a lot of power, but the rest of the year it's uh, somewhat less. Not an important, but not as much as people have claimed. The gray line there shows the across the year what the demand, the power demand is in the Bonneville, within the Bonneville customer utilities, there's about 140 of them, uh, about half of the region, I think, if you add it up. And it shows, you know, wintertime, uh, peak demand is pretty high, goes down in the spring, 
comes up a bit in the summer and then goes back up in the winter. So the dams, if you look at the blue uh, bars and then look at that uh, gray line, you'll see the dams really don't produce most of their power when we most need it. This is an important factor to consider going forward. If you can go to the next slide. Um, our organization, Northwest Energy Coalition, produced a study three years ago. You can go take a look at. We have the full study and you know summary sheets and so forth uh, on our website. Uh, the study was done by a, a very reputable technical consulting firm, and we wanted to look at the the big question: Could the dams come out, and we would still be able to keep the lights on, and have a reliable uh, system in the Northwest? So they did a very good study, and I'll go to the next and final slide here. We, uh, if you can go to the next slide, we we put together several different options for dam replacement, looking at re fully replacing what they do, and finding the cheapest and cleanest way to do that. What we call the balanced plus replacement portfolio includes energy efficiency, demand response, wind and solar. Um, we found that the this combination was actually a better match for the regional system over the year, so you get better reliability and resource adequacy. Not much of an impact on the cost side for the public power customers, maybe a buck fifty a month. We actually think that was a bit of a conservative estimate because resource costs have come down quite a bit since then, as most people now know. So all in all, that's a kind of thumbnail perspective on what the dams provide from the energy side, and a big picture question, could we replace the, that energy and actually get a better deal than we've got now? And we believe the answer is yes. If we go to the final slide, the punchline. This is our belief. Uh, we think we have a pathway forward to both protect salmon and to build the economy and do it in a clean, reliable, affordable way, and most of all, equitable. Thanks very much. Awesome, thank you, Fred. Um, and through smart investments, we can clearly restore salmon and fight climate change and invest in renewable energy economy. Um, there is uh, so much to gain and we have the solutions. Uh, but perhaps most importantly though, removing the four lower Snake River dams is a critical step that the federal government would take towards honoring treaties that it signed with dozens of Native American tribes including the Treaty of 1855 that the government signed with the Nez Perce. Um, as Elliot mentioned at the top, the Nez Perce and Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment have been leading this effort to restore the Lower Snake River for decades. And um, by removing these dams, this would be a high priority for the tribal government and many tribal members. So tonight we are going to hear from two other leaders from Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment, uh, board members Julian Matthews and Lucinda George, um, they'll be sticking around afterwards for some more questions, but we're going to go uh, down to the river with them uh, to some videos that they recorded earlier to welcome us to the Lower Snake River and talk about what restoring it would mean to them. And I think we have a video to play. My name is Julian Matthews. I'm enrolled in Nez Perce for Nimi Poo, and um, work, we've been working on this. Our group and other, a lot of other environmental groups have been working on uh, breaching the Snake River dams and removing them. And um, right behind me, directly behind me, is the Snake River, or was the Snake River when it was free flowing, and now it's part of the Granite, um, Lower Granite Dam Reservoir. And if you look over here, the clear water runs up that way. <clears throat> And so where we live, the Nimi Poo, we have treaty rights up this way and all the way up from the Clearwater up to the Locksaw Selway. And there's a lot of um, spawning habitat that has been destroyed and uh, been really impacted. A lot of the salmon runs impacted by these lower Snake River dams. And so we're trying to push to um, get those breaches so we can have salmon runs back like we had them before. And my main goal in doing this is to make sure that 50 years from now that the kids that are growing up now or the young people will be able to take salmon from that river because it's really a part of our culture. We have it, we use salmon for ceremonies. Um, um, we have services for uh, 
those members that have passed away, we have salmon. And so it's, it's a part of our culture. It's not just our treaty right, but it's a part of our culture. And we're trying to bring that back and make sure that we have salmon available for tribal members and for everyone pretty much. Because, but those dams, unless they're breached or removed, those lower snake, it's not going to happen. So that's our issue is removing or breaching the lower core snake river dam. So we appreciate your support and hope you'll support us and other groups' efforts in doing this. My name is Lucinda Simpson, and I work with Namibu Protecting on different issues that we have. One of them is we'd like to see these dams breached along the waterways here. The Nez Perce used to be able to travel in their canoes on these waterways, and they used to go um, through these. And Seminicum, Lewiston, was named after one of the Nez Perce names that they had. That means the meeting of both waterways. And um, so the Nimipu were here a long time ago, and they uh, use these waterways. Today, we can't use them the way we'd like to. We'd like to have more canoes on these waters. We'd like to have our children be able to canoe down these waters. Uh, we'd like to see a lot of salmon and a lot of steelhead and a lot of sturgeon. Uh, there's things that are missing here that need to be back in our picture again before they disappear and become extinct. All right, thank you for recording those videos and sharing your thoughts with us, Julian and Lucy. Like I said, Julian and Lucy, along with all of our other panelists, will be sticking around after for some questions. And it's clear, though, from all of them that we need to remove the four lower Snake River dams to save orcas, to combat climate change, and to honor tribal treaties and cultures. Now is the time for Congress to act, and the new proposal from Congressman Simpson gives us an opportunity to restore the river before it's too late. Now, we all know that one congressperson can't do this alone, and the proposal put forward by Congressman Simpson needs to be improved. We need other members of Congress to step up and commit to working with Congressman Simpson on a plan that removes the four lower Snake River dams and invests in a just transition for the region. So we need all of you to join with us in a social media storm targeting different members of Congress from Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Uh, usually our big group outside one of their offices would grab their attention, but instead we're gonna use social media, both Twitter and Facebook, to send a message to our elected officials that we need them to act. So on the screen, you will see some hashtags to use as well as different elected officials that we're targeting tonight. Um, there are three from each state. So if you're from Washington, you can tag all three of the offices in Washington. Same thing for Oregon and for Idaho. Um, if you're not from any of those states, it's a little bit of a grab bag. So feel free to uh, tag these folks and um, just make sure that you are using our hashtags. Uh, in the chat, we are also going to be sharing with you some sample tweets and Facebook posts that you can use. Uh, feel free to copy and paste these or tweak them to make them your own. Um, but the important thing is that you're tagging these elected officials. And if we're all posting and tagging and hashtagging, then we can really get the attention of these members of Congress and maybe even get the attention of some reporters to make bigger news on what we're working on. Um, we know that Fox News Radio already reported about this event tonight. Um, so we do want to create a huge uptick on social media for these congressional folks and really deliver a clear and consistent message to members of Congress that we need to restore the Snake River. So as you all are working on your tweets and your Facebook posts and you're not forgetting about your rally signs that you're making for the big photo and you're also putting in your questions and contributing to the word cloud, we got a lot going on. So. While you're working on all of that, I am thrilled to introduce a Northwest singer and songwriter, Casey Neal, who has prepared something special for all of us tonight. So make sure that you stick around after the performance for some more action items and the Q&A with our panelists. Uh, but for now, I am pleased to welcome Casey Neal. Casey. Hey, everybody. Is that all working? Okay. Sound good. All right. Um, greetings. Nice to see so many people on this call, um, on this rally. Uh, I'm here in Portland, Oregon as well. Um, uh, Multnomah, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala uh, land and more. Um, 
I'm going to sing a song for you guys uh, that's it was written by uh, Robert Hoyt, who's a uh, friend of mine. I haven't seen him in many years, but he lives in Indiana, uh, amazing environmental singer songwriter. And when I was asked to do this, uh, I immediately thought of this song and it's it's called Red River. And the Red River is a small uh, tributary of the South Fork uh, Clearwater in Idaho, uh, which, of course, uh, the Clearwater then a tributary of the snake. Um, so anyway, uh, he wrote this song here called Red River, and I'm going to sing it for you. And here we go. Since time immemorial, they've come from the sea, thousands of miles, and they'd end their journey. At the same place, they began a small fry, they'd come to spawn and then die. Feast for the creatures and the humans, too, and even then, plenty got through. They found their birthplace, no one knows how. All we know is that they don't come now. How did the Red River come by its name? Did it run red with salmon when the salmon runs came? Now all that it has come to an end, will the Red River run red again? came like some fatal disease built dams built roads and cut down the trees salmon eggs were crushed by the washed away land smothered by the mud and the sand how did the red river come by its name did it run red with salmon when the salmon runs came now stranger station that bears its name and if you should happen to pass by that way stop ask them see what they say how did the red river come by its name did it run red with salmon when the salmon runs came now all that it is come to an end Long since time to take down the dams, honor the treaties and defend the land. Let the Snake River again flow free as it flows to the Great Salish Sea. Awesome. Thank you so much, Casey. That was great. Um, such an inspiring song um, and really helps to get the activism going. Um, so I want to thank everybody for already working on the tweets and posts. I'm seeing lots of questions in the chat. Uh, so that's great. Keep them coming. And by coming together and taking these big actions on social media together, we can lead the largest river restoration project in history. Now, if you'll remember, at the start of the call, I told you that we were making a word cloud with the Menti uh, website. And uh, now let's pull that up to see what we got. Oh my gosh, so many great words in there. Salmon, orca, biodiversity. Uh, I see restoration, lamprey, tribal rights, restore. Uh, so many great and inspiring words that really show what is so important about this. And I think really importantly, it shows salmon at the center of all of it. That is so such a critical species when it comes to supporting 
the other wildlife and biodiversity that we love, supporting tribal and non-tribal communities who rely on salmon. And it is just such a part of the Northwest. We need to be standing up for salmon as much as we can. So um, now that it is time for Congress to act and we really want to, to motivate them to act, we'll be sharing this word cloud out with you later. So if you wanna post it on social media, that's great. Um, but we also wanna highlight all of the amazing signs that folks have been making tonight. And so um, before we start our Q&A, we're gonna be taking a big group photo. So we're gonna be switching to big gallery mode. Um, and if you are able to turn on your camera, um, I think that we're gonna make that work here. Um, so if you can turn on your cameras, if you made a rally sign and hold it up, if you didn't make a rally sign, but you still wanna look all excited, uh, you can do that too. Um, and we're gonna be taking a big group photo um, of all those signs. So it may take us a while to get all those folks on with videos. Okay, we're having some technical difficulties with video issues for participants. Well, I think if we are having trouble with videos, um, here's what we can do as an alternative. Um, another great thing that you can do with social media posts, you can't post just once, you gotta post a lot. So if you wanna take a selfie with the sign that you made and share that while tagging elected officials, that's a great way to show your support for this as well. Make sure to use the hashtag so that we can see y'all. Um, and yeah, this is one of the challenges of rallying it virtually instead of in person. But um, by taking your photos and sharing on social media, we'll still be able to get quite a big impact. Ah, I love the signs that I'm seeing up here though. Look at these, so mesmerizing. Wow. Okay, so um, make sure that you're doing those uh, posts and tagging elected officials. Um, and again, I wanna thank everyone for coming out for tonight's event, for being so engaged. Um, and for those who can and want to hang out for a while, we're gonna open up uh, the Q&A with our speakers. We've been getting quite a few questions in the uh, Q&A box. Make sure you're using that and not the chat. Things will get lost in the chat. Um, and yeah, we will uh, start up that soon. But um, for those who have to take off, uh, or everybody really, uh, make sure that you are staying up to date with the latest happenings with the campaign by following all of our organizations, Facebook and Twitter's accounts. Um, those will all be posted in the chat there. Um, so with that, let folks do that. And I will go ahead and pull up First question. So for all the panelists who spoke tonight, if you can make sure that your videos are on. Great. Okay. Um, so first question that we have in here, um, we're getting a lot of questions in here about why uh, not the focus on the Columbia dams. So um, Fred, Elliot, um, I'm not sure if either of you wants to take that question, but the question is, if it, aren't the Columbia dams also damaging to fish populations, why not focus on those? And let me get y'all. Well, I might be able to start. This is Elliot. Great, thanks Elliot. Sure, and um, uh, actually the uh, Yakima tribe has called for the um, taking down of the Columbia River um, dams, and um, we needed we needed to get started because uh, the salmon were in such a decline here on the Nez uh, within the treaty areas of the Nez Perce that we had to get started right away with um, our most um, our largest uh, block to the rivers, uh, the four lower Snake Rivers dams. So. Uh, that's why we got started, but we've always been concerned about the whole habitat that the salmon have, salmon and steelhead lampreys have to go through. So um, we're we're not just looking at 
lower snake dams, but we have to start somewhere. That's going to have the greatest immediate impact, we feel, but uh, we're going to look at the whole system. That That's what's called, has been called gravel to gravel management from the gravel in the uh, upper reaches of the rivers down into the ocean gravel uh, up the coast of, um, of North America. Uh, um, yeah, we, we really need to look at all areas and, and everything that it, just because we're going to breach the dams doesn't mean everyone can go home. We have climate change issues that we have to deal with and and habitats and uh, the hatcheries and, um, uh, you know, and uh, catching ha um, the uh, catch from the um, fishing, too. We have to look at look at those kinds of issues besides the ocean. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's complicated. Fred, did you have anything that you wanted to add on Columbia Dance? Well, I want to start by saying that the Northwest Energy Coalition is not any kind of expert on the salmon biology and the ecology, but <clears throat> I think we all follow those issues pretty closely. Uh, I definitely agree that the urgent need is to deal with the effect of the lower, the four lower snake dams. The science, uh, which you can look at, the uh, comparative survival study of really large uh, long running uh, review of uh, the hydropower impacts on the on the salmon um, shows that the four lower snake dams cause a tremendous amount of damage both going up and down the river and also what's the scientific term is delayed mortality and that fish that even uh, that make it through the first four lower Columbia dams that go into say Oregon tributaries and not further up the Snake River have a much higher survival rate than those that have to go through all eight of the lower Columbia and then the lower snake dams. So th this is really our priority right now. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Giles, there's a couple of questions about orcas in here. Um, one sort of quick one, everybody has heard about the new cap. Uh, folks wanna know how that cap is doing. Uh, but then also a question about um, if the orcas are starving, uh, isn't there options to feed the orcas to prevent extinction? Um, so at the, as far as I know, the new baby L125 born to uh, mom L86 uh, is still living. Uh, the calf, we don't know if it's a male or a female, uh, was lively and well filled out um, the last time it was seen. Uh, and then with regard to uh, feeding the salmon, I mean, I think that we, that's what we're talking about. I mean, feeding the whales, that's what we're talking about here. Um, it's, uh, it's most important for us to make sure that we are providing the, the salmon habitat so that the salmon can uh, become more robust and more abundant. And that's going to lead the, uh, you know, lead to more food for the whales. You know, these are this is an apex predator, uh, and we don't want to change their behavior um, as as least amount as possible. So the the idea of feeding them, um, I know I know that there's a certain amount of, um, you know, interest in that. Um, but uh, you know, really the the it's kind of the the best thing that we can do is recover their natural prey base. Awesome, thanks. Um, I, we are getting up to the top of the hour, but we've got a few other great questions in here. So we might hang a little long here tonight if folks wanna stick around for a bit. Um, one question uh, a lot of folks are asking, they're uh, really excited to, to learn more about uh, the history of the Nimipu people, um, specifically questions about um, how the Lower Snake River dams uh, are violating treaty rights and, and what specifically is being violated. So. I know Elliot or Lucy, Julian, uh, if one of you wants to take a crack at that one. I can jump in. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, I'm, I'm gonna hold up a document. I know and no one can read it, but um, this is a document that was produced by the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. And uh, it crit fic for short, um, uh, and um, I was on the, I was a commissioner when I was on tribal council and it's called the tribal circumstances and impacts from the lower snake river project. And that's on the Nez Perce, Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs and uh, Shoshone Bannock tribes. 
Um, so this is just the executive summary, but there's a larger document that explains the cultural impacts and even the nutritional impacts that the lack of salmon has caused our people. And uh, we can, we're, as somebody had mentioned earlier, we're all connected, we're connected. And, and um, so we're connected with the salmon and um, we're connected with the orcas because they're in the food chain of the, of the salmon. Same way we're connected with grizzly bears. That's why, we, that's why we're connected with uh, those folks that, that the equipment was headed to in the tar sands. Um, because we're all connected in, the, in that, uh, and we, would, we didn't want to be a part of that, that stream. So treaty rights, uh, the Nez Perce have been here. There was a, a, um, uh, an archaeological site uh, called Cooper's Ferry. It's about 40 miles from where I live, 40 to 50 miles, I guess. And um, that is one of the oldest archaeological sites in North America. They date that... Um, carbon dated, dated that to about um, uh, 16,000 years, which means that our people have been here that long. And so during that time, we've, we lived in, uh, in an intimate relationship with uh, salmon and all the animals here. And so we can, we can tell when they're hurting because we're hurting at the same time. We've developed that type of a relationship. And so we wanted to make sure that we were able to continue, continue our lifestyle when, uh, when the West uh, was uh, uh, settled by um, Euro-Americans. And uh, that's what we negotiated with the United States is that we would cede all of that land for, that, for the Western, westward migration in exchange for continuing our ways of life which included salmon and fishing and, and hunting. Um, I'm a buffalo hunter and so is Julian. We go over to Montana and hunt buffalo because that's traditionally what we did. And so we, we went from uh, buffalo country all the way down the, to the Columbia River to fish. And we have tribal members. My son is a commercial fisherman on the Columbia River and we want to protect that, but there's not enough people that can do that. You have to be uh, right uh, these days. You have to be uh, economically uh, viable in order to do some of these things now. And so it's not available to uh, our family members, uh, people of the tribe. And so we see that 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 has caused many things, uh, health problems. We are we amongst our health disparities that we have, we're especially vulnerable to things like the pandemic when it comes through. And so um, we, we attribute that to the lack of salmon in our diets anymore. Um, and then, and then <clears throat> excuse me, and then when we do get the salmon, you know, it has to be a quality. You saw those pictures of the, how large the salmon used to be. There used to be millions of salmon that would come back to this part of the country. And now we don't even, sometimes we don't even have seasons for, for being able to fish because of the decline of, of um, salmon. And so, um, you know, when that's, that's part, that's the issue is that we want the United States to its word. We want them to live up to those promises. And, and uh, otherwise we can uh, take back that land that we ceded, you know, most of central Idaho um, since uh, the, the salmon and, and lampreys and steelhead are being mismanaged. But no one wants to see that. But that's that may be a reality, if you know we don't uh, if we don't do something urgent, if we don't do something right away, because um, we have 13 species that are threatened or in danger of extinction right now along the Columbia. We have to do something now. Simpson's plan off provides that opportunity, and uh, we're all supportive of that. Like I said, Yakimas, Umatillas, they've come out in support of it as well because they're treaty tribes too. Thanks so much, Elia. And for the document that you just showed, we'll make sure that we get a link to that and share it with folks in some of the follow-up materials so that they can read it more. Um, Julian, Thank you, Rob. Yeah, Julian, I see your hand up. And um, I also wanted to flag that there's been some questions about the canoes. Um, and I thought maybe you could uh, chat a little bit about some of the canoe work that you've done with uh, students on the reservation. Okay, yeah, we, um, we have, we, 
<clears throat> did a canoe. Well, what happened was um, I really like what Elliot was saying, because that's when you look at the treaty, it's an agreement between us and the federal government as Nez Perce, because we have kind of dual citizenship. We're members of the tribe federally recognized, and then we're also regular citizens of whatever state we live in in the U.S. government, United States. And so that's important to remember the treaties, like um, when he first started getting involved with a lot of groups, they didn't, it seemed like people didn't really know that the treaty was still in, intact, you know, it didn't go away or fade into history that is still a written agreement between us and the federal government with our tribe. And um, so that I, I guess I'll go to <clears throat> canoes. We started um, the first free, I think it was the first free of the snake flotilla. We were um, down there and there, were, there was a couple tribal uh, canoe families coming up to, um, well, it was down by Hawaii. It's uh, kind of a traditional area, Hawaii Canyon. And now it's part of the reservoir. It's all blocked up because of the reservoir. Uh, behind Lower Granite Dam, and so we were down there doing our um, Frida Snake Flotilla floating from Hawaii Canyon <clears throat> to the um, dam and with a bunch of people, and there were some tribal people there that had some canoes, so there's some other non-tribals that were, we were talking to them about doing a canoe, so we um, started working on thinking about get uh, doing our own canoe, and uh, so the ne Mimipu, the Nez Perce used to, like Lucy was saying in the video, we used to float up and down that river prior to the dams and you know you could go up we're pretty much travel anywhere with a canoe and um so that's being really that was really impactful so we started looking at the use of canoes or the carving of canoes by Nez Perce and um it was really interesting because we there's a guy at the park um I forgot Bob Chenoweth he was doing he did a lot of research on canoes all over the world with the tribe different Indian tribes first nations you know the Maori people Australians New Zealand and so we started talking to him about the canoes and he had some uh, designs, I guess you'd call them on uh, Nez Perce or Ninipu canoes. And so we started getting people together. And then uh, Jim Jameson, he's kind of a master carver, cars canoes all over the um, world, essentially Alaska, Hawaii, have been different places and he's really sharp. And um, so we uh, got with him and he became our kind of master carver. And so we got the log up from the Selway and um, had to get a special use permit because it's on roadless and wilderness. And, and I told them, I don't want to get chop a tree down and get it. So we, you know, because that's not really environmentally to me, chopping trees, <laughs> chopping trees down. Uh, but uh, so we found a couple that were, had bl been blown over by the wind. The forest service said we get them. So we brought one, we had a cedar, but we couldn't get that one. So we got a yellow fur and start, um, took it down to the, we call it the Nimi Puka's new site in Lapway next to our uh, clinic. The tribe Neptic Council let us use the land. And so then we started, the kids were coming over there. So there's 34, 4th and 5th graders, and they're going to start up again. They haven't been there since the uh, pandemic almost a year. So they're going to start up again next Wednesday. We have them come over there and we have the log. And we um, actually started the carving in July and it was really hotter than heck. And uh, so then in August, September, the uh we got canopies and stuff to cover us in the shade because it was really hot and kind of lost a lot of our volunteers. The first day we started was 103 in Lapway and we had about eight or nine volunteers and next week they, we had about four because it was really hot and we didn't have any covering. So um, then then we carved for a while and um, then the kids came and they started carving on it and started learning how to use the wood woodworking tools, adzes, um, diff all different types of um woodworking so they helped us and we started in about um july of 2017 and finished it in 2018 uh because we we're just working on it like once a week on wednesdays when the kids were there um and so then we um uh, got it done and then um did a test run down on the river clear water and worked great and then we uh used it in the next flotilla in 2018 down at um i believe it was at the chief timothy so we uh, put it in the water down um, down at uh, uh, lower so lower Hog Island. Put it in the water there and floated. Didn't float paddle. We floated most of the way pretty good when the clear water, but when we hit the um, reservoir, then the water just stops. Basically, it's like Lucy was saying. Seminicum is the place where the snake and the clear water come together, and, and then the reservoir is so backed up. Uh, that then we had to start paddling and then we it took us about seven hour jaunt from where we left to um, the island where the people were all the people were down there that's where they're kind of centralized to actual activity and so Chief Timothy Island and so we made it down there and um, 
and we're going to work on it. And, and what the purpose of that was, I mean, was is to carve a canoe too, but it was mainly to bring um, the issue of the use of canoes that's similar to the salmon of how they can't go back and forth on the river because of the dams, because of the reservoirs. And so it was kind of a two theme project and uh, kids really liked it. Earth Justice paid to do a video of the whole thing. It's called A Healing Journey. It's on YouTube and it's on our website too. And I will mention, I believe we have a copies of the treaty of the Nest Purses on our website, nimipuprotecting.org. So if you go there and go to documents, we have some other documents that are kind of pertinent to the tribe or things that have gone on. And so, um, but as far as the um canoe we're gonna carve another one here we got a uh, our hooks into another cedar log so we're gonna start working on that and and what we're trying to do with the kids is, is just show them how you know we're and we use metal tools and we, we haven't burned one out yet like they used to do but we're trying to show the kids how to use something that comes from nature that you don't have to go and you know buy a fiberglass you know boat or canoe that you can carve one and, and it's a good skill it's kind of a it was really a community building activity because the kids come in there then their parents would come there then we had a lot of volunteers we had all kinds of people coming through when we were carving it we even um when we were up on carving the salish kootenai i was posting the pictures on our facebook and the salish kootenai the vice chairman about five tribal members they saw it and so they drove down there one time it was like in midwinter i was surprised in january from uh, i think they were in Ronan or somewhere around there montana it's really wintry and uh, so they came down there then they because they wanted to see our canoe and they wanted to talk to us about how to carve one so they um we just talked to them told them about the tools and what to get and all that then they they went back and they carved a couple um a year ago i believe and then put them on the water up there in salish and there's a lot of other tribes Kalispell, Colville, spokane um and then on the west side there's a lot more they uh, i think on the west side a lot of them kept that kind of canoe carving intact like over here like we hadn't carved um, a canoe at Nespers on the reservation, current reservation, like in a hundred years. So that was pretty cool. And um, so we're, we're still working on that kind of stuff, but we're trying to tie it all into the, the rivers and the water. And um, like Elliot was saying, there's a lot of impacts on that water with the dams. And if you're ever seeing those reservoirs behind like lower granite, it's just like, it's really in the summer, it gets about a hundred degrees in Lewis and those, those reservoirs are just like, like, just disgusting. They're like these guy, like, yes, you know, hot water. It looks like boy, some just really gross looking water because, and and I don't know. So anyway, the the dam breaching is really critical to us. I just talked to the chairman yesterday. And, you know, it's pretty cool because we've been pushing the tribe. Like sometimes I always tell people, you know, like you know, like the tribe has. They're not always on board with what we as individuals want to do. It's kind of like I'd say, well, does Donald Trump represent your your views and your, you know, what you want? Obviously not. So it's similar to the tribe. Like we're kind of battling with our tribe over this issue. I mean, seriously battling because they didn't like us talking because they get a lot of money from the BPA, you know, a lot of tribes. And they, like you see that BPA likes to hand out that money. And, you know, kind of to me, it's, it's like, OK, here's the money you know, keep your mouth shut or whatever. But yeah. anyway, so now Shannon Wheeler, the chairman's really on board. The rest of the council are really on board with supporting this. So it's kind of, uh, it's really nice to see because that really helps us. And um, because like the treaty right, that what we're talking about is the right to take salmon from that river. And it doesn't say, you know, hatchery salmon or go stand at the, you know, the ladder and catch them when they come up back to the, it just, to me, it's like, so it's like almost so unreal the way the salmon issues are you know it's a big commercial industry the state of Idaho makes a lot of money you know they have fishing licenses you know um all fishing related gear boat jet boats and all this big industry off of this whole thing and so now but but now with the salmon it's affecting them so now it, it's kind of funny to me like I was reading in um some of the um well even with the wolf recovery you know, the tribes are not even mentioned in that, you know, we have a treaty, right? And it's just like the states are always in the ESA, you know, they just go from federal to state. They don't, they might say, oh, talk to the tribes or, but it, to me is kind of lame. And that's what another issue we're trying to work on with the Endangered Species Act, which is this, this is affecting to the salmon um, that we want to make sure that tribes get some foothold in there, hopefully with this new administration, with this Holland going in there, 
um, that we'll be able to um, push for changes to the ESA to where tribes are allowed to administer the delisting when species are delisted, like within our reservation, within our treaty area. And one thing I will say, um, you know, people they get the idea that, you know, you put an Indian in a position or you get an Indian or a tribal man in a position that everything's great, but, you know, we don't know for sure because, you know, it's still like, you know, working for the man, I guess you could say, you know, it's kind of like if, if Elliot and I worked at our tribe, we may or may not be able to speak our views because, you know, you work for the tribe and it's kind of like, to me, that's one thing about our group is we have a free voice. Our funding comes from grants and, and uh, foundations. So, you know, it's like, we don't have to cow town to, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I can speak how I feel and not have to worry about any repercussions, whether from my tribe or anyone else that, you know, may be over me. And so that's really nice, but you know, yeah, the we councils. Really appreciate, we appreciate all the words that you share with us tonight. I see Lucy's hand up, so I want to get to her. Um, we're going to hang out for just a little bit more, but if folks need to drop off, we are recording this. So feel free to watch it there. But Lucy, um, I want to hear from you and, and your thoughts. Um, the, they were talking about, someone mentioned the treaties and um, we've had trouble with that because public law uh, 83280 is in Washington, Oregon and Idaho. Mm -hmm. And so if we have trouble going and fishing someplace where it's an accustomed, uh, usual and accustomed place, uh, then they might take us in for, um, fishing someplace they think we shouldn't have been fishing. So then it goes to the state courts because of that public law 280. And so that's part of the treaty that's not really upheld because then the states can deny the tribal people the right to go ahead and have it transferred to federal or to tribal court. And that's a problem with the treaty. I mean, it, that wasn't passed until 69 by legislation. So it's just another roadblock for treaties, you know, to try and keep us from doing the things that we did do. And our creation story is, is founded on the, partly on the salmon because the salmon, um, when the crater was developing our land and our area for the Nimipu people, uh, the, the salmon said they would give their life for us. And in doing that, we said we would go ahead and uh, protect the salmon. And by breaching the dams is one way that uh, I can see that we can protect uh, the salmon, hold to the salmon, what we said we would do. We, would, we said we'd protect them during our creation story. And <clears throat> we really haven't had been able to have our traditional salmon feast as usual because there's not any salmon to have. Two years ago, Nathan Small said that they only had one salmon in the Fort Hall area for all their members that they have in their tribe. You know, one salmon for all the Fort Hall people. And we're at the tail end of the, the chain here. Um, so we get very little salmon out of this. The other tribes that are on the uh, Columbia, the, low, uh, the uh, lower part of the snake, they have access to the fish before we do. We have only so many tribal um, fishermen that go down there now because like Julian said, the cost to get down there and get your boat and gas and stay down there and food and lodging, all that, it's pretty expensive for us anymore. Even when we go buffalo hunting, as they were saying, you know, when last time I went out buffalo hunting, I think I spent $1,800 on one trip. You have to pay for your expenses, your weapon, your um, ammunition. You got to pay for, you know, your tools you need. And that becomes a problem for us to, to really have, you know, have those treaty rights upheld for us because they know, hey, you know, we, you know how, and many of them can't afford to do that. And so the Nez Perce go in groups when they go to Buffalo hunt, like Julian's probably going to go with his brother and Elliot probably goes with his family. And uh, I just talked to um, Louis Rubin, another guy that works with us in the canoe project and his whole family is going over there, but that's the only way they can afford to do that. And that's another barrier for our treaties. So that, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Lucy, and, and so much, uh, so many folks in the chat are just really highlighting how much 
folks like us really want to help and support you all and support the effort to restore the river, you can really hear the real impact that that has had on people. And it is well past time that these dams get removed. Um, and we are well past time on our uh, event tonight. There were so many other great questions in the chat. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, um, but we are gonna be sending up a follow-up email to everybody who registered here tonight with a bunch of different information, including this recording. Um, and there'll be a lot of other things in there. Um, there were a lot of good questions about the specifics in the Simpson proposal and what it means for all sorts of different people. Um, the general approach that this proposal is taking is that he wants to make sure everybody's taken care of and that there's a just transition for folks who currently rely on the dams. But there's a lot more details than that. And we'll include links so that you can explore that proposal, see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And most importantly, we'll send you the things that you can do to stay engaged and keep active in this campaign so that we can finally restore the Lower Snake River and restore the salmon that so many of us rely on. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.